Well, welcome to worship, everyone, here at Good Shepherd Presbyterian Church. For those who are worshiping with us online, uh, we love having you as well. Uh, it's good to be together in God's house as we uh, meet together, because actually we are the body of Christ uh, together, not just physically, but in spirit as well. Uh, Pastor Robert is still on vacation this week, and today uh, Jim Hinton will be giving us God's word, and I look forward to that later on in the service. Um, I don't have any other announcements other than to say as we enter worship together this morning, if you recall last week's message, I want to start and bring us into worship by asking a question. How have you worshiped this week? What have you done to worship the Lord at home, at work, in your neighborhood? As we enter worship, let's hear what the early church did in Acts 2, 44 through 47. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Come, let us worship the Lord now. We'll do that in song. Yeah. 
May the peace of Christ be with you. We pray that the peace of Christ may be with you as well. Amen. At this time, we'd like to wish the peace of Christ for all of you. And until we meet again, may the peace of Christ be with you. 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 Also with you. Peace! And may the peace of Christ be with you. At this time, I'm going to read from God's word. And after that, we will go right into a message uh, for our kids. So here from Psalm 103, verses 19 through 21. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his sovereignty rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his, a- you his angels, mighty in strength, who perform his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you who serve him, doing his will. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, boys and girls. It's so nice to see you again through um, virtual worship. Um, I hope that you are enjoying your summer and you're getting to play at the pool and in the backyard and um, just having all sorts of fun, not worrying about your schoolwork and not worrying about Zoom meetings at school and all those things, that you can just relax and enjoy the summer. Um, Today we are talking about the kingdom of God, and that sounds like a really big thought. And the kingdom of God is really big. Think about a kingdom as a group that is reigned over by someone. And in this instance, that's God. And I want us to think about, when I was trying to think about how to talk about the kingdom of God, one of my favorite parables came to mind. And that's the parable of the mustard seed. And um, it helps me to understand my place in the kingdom of God. And that's what I want you to think about today. So listen as I read a little bit of that parable that Jesus used. Um, It says, so what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Is it, it is like, Jesus said, a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants. Such, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. So you're talking about the teeny tiniest seed. I want you to think for a minute about an apple seed, because you've all seen an apple seed. And when you cut your apple open and it has seeds inside. So you know if you go plant that seed outside and you wait long enough, you'll have an apple tree. And that apple tree will grow, produce lots and lots of apples. And every one of those apples will produce that many more seeds that could be planted to produce that many more apples. It just is a multiplying effect. So, but think about a seed even smaller than that. And when you plant it, it grows into a plant that is tall enough and branchy enough to nest birds and to provide shade. And God knew when he created that mustard seed that was so teeny that people would probably go, eh, that's not gonna do anything. And God said, no. I know the potential of that mustard seed. I know what it can grow into. So plant it, and it'll grow into a plant big enough to to nest birds and to provide shade and leaves um, because that's its job, and that's what it's supposed to do. And if we think about us in the kingdom of God, um, way back when Jesus was on earth, he started the kingdom of God with the disciples. At first there were two, and then there were four, and then there were six, and all of a sudden there are twelve. And those twelve went everywhere with Jesus, teaching others about Christ, and as they taught more about Christ and showed God's love to others, more people came into the kingdom because they said, yes, I want to follow Jesus. And so they became part of God's kingdom, and then they went out and told other people about Jesus, and kept growing and growing and growing God's kingdom. And so today, We are God's kingdom. Our churches are God's kingdom. The people in our church, your family, those who trust in Christ are part of God's kingdom. And we have a job to do. God knows our potential. God knows our our path in life. And you may be thinking, I'm just a child. But you are not just a child. You are a child of God. 
and you are an important part of God's kingdom, and God can use you for his kingdom. Maybe it's a person at school that you talk to and you just show kindness and love to, and someday they learn that that's because you know Jesus and you're showing them God's love. Or maybe it's a person you meet at the pool this week and you just show them an extra ounce of love and compassion. Or maybe it's obeying your parents and doing the right thing because you love God and God teaches us to obey our parents. So you have a job to do, and God knows your potential. God knows exactly what he is going to call you to do and what he's calling you to do today. And so we just have to trust and have faith and pray and talk to God and read God's word and try to figure it out and try to, to do what God wants us to do. Because you have the potential of a mustard seed to be big and do great things and teach more people about Christ and tell more people about Christ and love people into Christ. Um, you have just as much potential as the teeny tiniest seed we know on earth. And that's important for you to remember. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for today. We just pray that you would help us to know how to love, who to love, um, who to share Christ with, when to share Christ. And God, that we can just trust you enough to know that you have a plan, that your plan is perfect, and that we are an important part of God's kingdom, and that you can use us to grow your kingdom and to share your word with other people. We thank you, and we praise you, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Go and grow God's kingdom today. Know your potential and, and tell others about Christ as you walk this world. Our second passage is from Matthew 13, verses 24 through 30. Jesus presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. But when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. The slaves of the landowner came, to, came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, for while you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First, gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them up. But gather the wheat into my barn. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jim. Hope the light's not glaring off my head too badly. <laughs> Um, I want to, uh, it's first time in the church for, for five months uh, for Angela and I, which is, uh, we've been sheltering up, up where we live and uh, it's good to be back. I, I, um, I so appreciate uh, all the efforts that have been made to uh, uh, let us worship the way we're worshiping and uh, uh, Robert and Eric and uh, the guys in the sound booth, the other people who've helped so much, I could just only uh, share a heartfelt thanks for enabling us to uh, be together in that somewhat limited way, but uh, nonetheless be together as we worship. So uh, thank you. you know? and, uh, and gosh, I listened to Melissa cover the kingdom, and as is pointed out sometimes, it's better than what the sermon deliverer prepared. You know? so, uh, so she did a great job with that. I, I thank her for that. Um, what we wanted to do, though, today is uh, is look. Uh, I wanted to look back at where we've been, just to kind of catch us up and get us on the uh, on the path that we've been on of looking at uh, uh, the Bible in fourteen sentences, seven in the Old Testament, seven in the New. Uh, we uh, uh, got it up on the screen here. The Old Testament, you'll remember this, I hope, but. Uh, uh, creation was the was the first one, and we focused on the very first verse in Scripture. In the beginning, God created uh, the heavens and the earth, and we walked away from that study realizing uh, 
It's kind of a blinding glimpse of the obvious. The, the earth belongs to the Lord, you know. In Psalm, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Uh, and the, the operation of the universe and the earth is dependent upon God. We, we see that uh, uh, in Hebrews. We see that in Colossians. Um, and the earth was good and when God created it. And so when we think of our role with creation, uh, we are, I think at best, uh, uh, tenants of God by his, with his permission and, as Melissa said, with responsibility. So that was when we looked at creation. With Abraham, and that spans a long time between creation and Abraham. Uh, Abraham, we have the most famous uh, call of all, uh, is uh, uh, in the, uh, I will make you a great nation and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. This was the promise made to Abraham. And, and the timeline sometimes interests me, but between Abraham and Jesus' arrival, which ushered in the solution to that, to, to what was offered to Abraham, it's 2,000 years elapsed, you know. So, uh, you know, we had the stories of Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and we wind up in Egypt and in slavery, and then we looked at the Exodus. Moses is in the picture there, and uh, uh, the Lord tells Moses, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, uh, once again uh, delivered uh, from their problems. Um, we, skip on, we skip on down, uh, and uh, Israel wanted a king eventually. They, they looked around, and other folks had kings. And God, uh, it seems like almost reluctantly said, okay, you want a king, you can have a king. And we had several kings. Saul was the first. Uh, the most famous was David, who was described as a man after God's own heart. Uh, David did great things. He had great sins as well. But he did great things, and, and they, they flourished under David. The kingdom of Israel did. And then we had prophets who got onto the scene, and they were very important because they were speaking uh, for God to the, to the Israelites and to the leaders. And often what they were having to do was to bring them back to God. You know, we would, we would wander off this way and that way. We'd fall into sin and, and the prophets would, would have to call us back. Uh, we looked at a verse there with the prophets from Micah, a very uh, famous verse, a good verse. And it's, it, it kind of takes, all the rules and regulations out of Leviticus and the Ten Commandments, and it, it, it answers the question simply, what does the Lord require of you? And it says, what does the Lord require of you? This is Micah 6, 8. But to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. So, you know, it's kind of a, a, a way to look at what God requires of us other than this endless list of rules and regulations that, that had come out of the uh, of Moses era. Uh, so that was uh, uh, the prophet week. And the, we did have a look at the gospel in Isaiah. Uh, and you know, we uh, a lot of times at Christmas time we look back and read scripture from Isaiah that was you know looking forward to Christ. And, and Isaiah was hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ. But uh, a, a verse we focused on there with, and I call it, we call it a gospel look, was uh, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the one who brings good news. And that reference of the one, of course, is to Jesus. Uh, where we are, we can look back and things kind of can, can put together a lot easier than they probably could at the time. And then we had a, a Claire that uh, did the sermon a couple of weeks ago with Psalms and Wisdom, and she focused on uh, perhaps the most well-known psalm of all, the 23rd Psalm, uh, and the Lord is my shepherd. And she did a nice job covering that. So uh, as we shift to the New Testament, I wanted to maybe catch you up with what has happened just before Jesus arrived. Um, and I'll back up to, to David's kingdom. Uh, David uh, in, in, had acquired the area that we know as Jerusalem, made it the, the center of his kingdom, a beautiful temple was built not by David, but by his son Solomon. Uh, and uh, David and Solomon both ruled. Um, after Solomon, it was kind of shaky about the kings, and the, and the kingdom became divided. I mean, we had, we had a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom after that, a lot of infighting. Uh, and eventually, uh, around the, in the 500s B.C., Israel and Judah and the northern kingdom 
fell to the Babylonians. And, uh, and this was a big exile. The Babylonians came, they kind of took the city, they, took, uh, they tore the temple down, and they exiled uh, God's people, the Israelites, uh, into, Babylon, into Babylon. Fortunately, Babylonia, Babylon fell as well to King Cyrus and the Persians. And Cyrus, who was uh, seemed to be attentive to God, uh, uh, felt like and with God's leading that he ought to be able to send the Israelites back. So 60 years later, after their exile, they start to come back in waves. They rebuild the temple, and we get ourselves down to about 400 years before Christ. In, 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 in biblical terms, we think of those as kind of the quiet years because there's not a book of the Bible that was addressing that period of time. <clears throat> but what happened uh, to the Israelites in that time, it, it was a quiet time. They were under the rule of the Persians, and that went pretty well for them. Uh, but in that 400 years, they also, Persia fell to Alexander the Great and the Greeks, and they were under Greek rule. Uh, and then the Roman Empire overtook the Greek Empire, and they were under Roman rule. And you know, all the way down to Jesus, they, they were a Roman province you know, by the time Jesus came. Uh, and and you, you hear a lot of back and forth about the Romans in Scripture. But within Israel, uh, and, and partly out of the work of one of the prophets at the time, Ezra, uh, they began looking at the, the God's law to them both the Ten Commandments and all the laws and regulations that went with it that we find in Leviticus primarily. And they got a group that formed that started big focus on this, which was a good thing. Uh, in the New Testament, we know that group is the Pharisees. Uh, now they got over exuberant uh, with what they did and they started adding things to God's law. Uh, here's an application. You can't go more than 12 feet from such and such on the Sabbath. You know, it's things like that. So, you know, Jesus challenged them a lot, and they had trouble with Jesus as well, uh, again, because of their hyper-focus, I think, on the law. So that gets us, what did I do, 10 minutes? That's the Old Testament, you know? Um, <laughs> let me take a sip of water. And so here we find the Israelites still looking for a Messiah that got more specifically promised to David, that's going, somebody coming out of David's line, that would be a king that would reign forever and they're looking for that so oh let me get let me get out of the old testament here for a minute so when we turn to the new testament we're finding an expectation of a messiah and it, of course it wasn't what jesus was when he came the expectation was different uh, i think uh a description that is is i think pretty accurate is i think they were looking for a superhuman composite of maybe abraham moses David, Elijah, you know, looking back at their, their heroes of the past. One who would unite Israel and establish his, his kingship over that, and one who would establish his kingship over the other kingdoms. So they're looking for somebody uh, that could really uh, take down the Romans, I think, to start with, and looking for somebody who could establish the kingdom. And so they were seeing, you know, the old world and a new world, you know, that's, that's going to come with his king. So here comes Jesus, and we're, we're into the New Testament. So Jesus arrives and is the one to fulfill the promise to Abraham, which again was 2,000 years ago at this point. And, and what we have come to know, and, uh, and the, the gospel writers, it took them a long time to get to this point. It was a very spectacular, epic uh, controversial, uh, transformational kind of way that Jesus came and became the Messiah. Only after, if you look at the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the, and the ones who spent so much time with him, it was only after his resurrection and the Holy Spirit came and indwelled them as they were going to take off on, on God's mission that they really put it all together about who Jesus was. Uh, they struggled with understanding him a lot uh, during his ministry. Uh, they didn't understand some of the parables. Uh, they didn't understand this, tear this house down and I'll rebuild it in three days. They're thinking about rebuilding the temple. And Jesus is thinking about resurrection. And uh, so it was only later, and the gospel writers 
who have, have written with God's oversight, uh, wonderful gospels, they were written 30, 40, 50, 60 years after Jesus' death. You know, so there wasn't a, not an immediacy to, to their writing of it. In fact, the first, uh, the, first old, uh, the first New Testament book that was written was Paul's letter to the Galatians. I mean, it, it was the first book written. Sometimes we might want to think they're kind of written in order of what we, how we see them, but that's not how they're in the New Testament. So the, uh, so the first sentence of, of the New Testament is Peter's answer to Jesus. Y'all, y'all probably remember uh, the setup. Jesus is with his disciples. Jesus says, uh, you know, who, who do these folks say that I am? And several of them spoke up. Some say you're John the Baptist. You know, some say you're Jeremiah. Uh, some say you're Elijah or some other prophet. And Jesus kind of narrows the focus and looks. I can imagine him looking, you know, with a little bit of firmness in his eyes, but who do you say I am? And Peter nails, the, nails it. He nails it with his answer. Uh, he says, you are the Messiah. The Messiah. Not a Messiah, not another Messiah. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And, uh, you know, Jesus, uh, in, in, the next, uh, in the next verse, Jesus said, you know, Simon Peter, this answer didn't come from you, it came from the Father. So I could, as many times as Peter put his foot in his mouth, I can imagine that, you know, before he could feel good about his answer, Jesus said, you know, it really didn't come from you, Peter, it came from above. So uh, I appreciate Peter so much. So... Uh, the a Messiah implies the anointed one. Anointing was uh, uh, done, it was done in priestly and religious circles. It also just kind of embraced God's endorsement of what was going on and the fact God was going to be with you. The son of the living God uh, says a lot because Jesus, instead of being that super composite guy of the heroes they knew, here was Jesus with a divine origin, a divine life, and a divine destiny. And he's basically presenting God to the world. And uh, that's what we looked at with the the first verse. So that brings us to the second sentence. And uh, I'm tempted to say Melissa told you everything about it. uh, And uh, but we'll we'll run through this anyway. In Mark 115, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. if you explore the phrase, the kingdom of God, or less used was the kingdom of heaven, uh, and I think it's fair to think of them interchangeably. Matthew seemed to think of them interchangeably. If you look at his work, you'll find something really interesting. Uh, kingdom appears, the word kingdom appears 126 times in the gospels. Jesus refers to the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven 84 times. If you, if you subtract out what might be duplicates from among the gospel writers about the same incident, you'll find 75 separate sayings of Jesus about the kingdom. So when you think of what Jesus was primarily about, it's a, it's a pretty good clue that the fact he talked about the kingdom that many times, that might have been his central focus. And in fact, in Luke 4, 43, Jesus says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well. For I was sent for this purpose. So even Jesus, uh, in responding to his disciples who wanted him to stay where he was, he said, I've got to go preach the gospel, the kingdom of God in the other towns. That's why I'm here. You know. So the kingdom is, is an important, just a very important aspect of what Jesus was about. And you'll be familiar with these. You find them in Scripture. You you find that your kingdom can be entered. Uh, You find that some are in the kingdom already. You find that some are described as being near the kingdom. And you find some described as being far from the kingdom. You have the kingdom compared to the mustard seed, tiny seed, big outcome. You have the kingdom compared to the yeast in a bread, tiny bit of yeast, big outcome. Uh, You have the kingdom uh, uh, illustrated its value by saying, if you found something so valuable, you would sell everything you had to uh, attain it. That's what the kingdom's like. It's like that precious pearl you might have sold everything you had to acquire. 
the kingdoms like that. So the kingdom shows up so many times, and, and we and scripture's clear. Uh, the kingdom of God is at hand. That's one of these tricky things because the kingdom started when Jesus came and, and his life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, his defeat over death uh, began his kingdom. And yet the whole world is still here like it was. You know? And so we have, a, you know, we have this intersection of time. And here you go. The Israelites, if you look at the, uh, uh, the PowerPoint, the Israelites were looking for a leader that's going to come in and kind of immediately change this world to the new world by reestablishing Israel and conquering these other kingdoms. But Jesus came in while the old world still existed, and his, his view of the kingdom was that it overlaps the world to come. It began when Jesus came two, uh, now 2,000 years ago, and at his second coming, the kingdom will be fully realized. So. We have this whole uh, thought about the kingdom is here already, and yet it's yet to come. And so uh, the little circles kind of illustrate that. We live in that middle shaded area, because that area is bound by Jesus' first coming and Jesus' second coming. And it's kind of like that parable that we read that, uh, um, that, that talked about the wheat and the weeds coexisting and the answer, do you, do you want me to go pull the weeds up? No, because I don't. I want to be careful not to lose any of the wheat. But the harvest will come, and then I'll pull that up, and I'll separate them. Well, that's just a, a, a picture of Judgment Day. Uh, so right now we we, you know, we coexist with uh, if we're the wheat, we coexist with the weeds. Uh, I kind of think of it as we're trying to figure out how to turn some of the weeds into wheat. I think that has to <laughs> to do with kingdom work. Uh, for Jesus, but uh, so this uh, this kingdom that is started with Jesus is a divine kingdom. It's instigated by Jesus, by his life, by his ministry. <clears throat> While Jesus certainly was a prophet and a teacher, he was also the one to deliver the kingdom of God. And the disciples he recruited were not just ones to become followers who say, "Yeah, I believe into Jesus," but but ones to become those who help him with the growth of the kingdom, with the advance of the kingdom. I think that's what he, I think that's how he thinks of us as well. Um, so if the kingdom is that important to Jesus, uh, what does that say about our mission? What does that say about the mission of, uh, of Good Shepherd as well? Uh, and we, just like the wheat among the weeds, uh, we live as Jesus' followers, and we should be mimicking him and investing in the kingdom building here on earth. We look for opportunities to share the gospel. We remember, I think, the Great Commission. I've got it here. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, Go ye therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And I lo, I am with you until the end of the age. So Jesus was all about this work with the kingdom, this work with uh, sharing his gospel. And it's really the work with the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham to be a blessing to all the nations. And so what do, what do we do? Well, I think that uh, uh, other than you know, remembering the Great Commission, living not just passively, waiting for heaven to happen, but, but living actively, doing work with the kingdom is what we're called to do. I think we should get inspired by stuff like the Sermon on the Mount, the high callings that Jesus has there. We want a world of peacemakers, those who care for the needy, those who pray for their enemies, those who are merciful, those who are pure in heart. Yes, the answer for us is we strive to do all those things. For after all, we are the kingdom people. Amen.
Every week we have a time of confession and an assurance of grace to remind ourselves our need for the Lord and to respond uh, to what we've heard uh, in repentance and humility. Um, At this time, uh, you're invited to reflect on the words to give us clean hands as a prayer of confession. At this time, we are going to respond to God's word with a time of confession. And today we're going to do that by singing, Give Us Clean Hands. And the assurance of God's grace comes to us from Ephesians 1, verse 7. Rejoice and hear the good news. In Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of God's grace. Thank God for his mercy and grace. You are invited to use the words of the song, Even So Come, on today's scripture and sermon and your own offering of self in response. You may also place your offering in the boxes at the back on your way out. We respond to God's word by offering ourselves to him. Let's sing the song, Even So Come. Let's sing together. All of creation, all of the earth, make straight a highway, a path for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Call back the sinner and wake up the saint. Let every nation shout of your faith. Jesus is coming. Lord Jesus. 
I have said those words a few times over the past five months. Lord, anytime, really, anytime. Um, at this time in the service, we get to offer our prayers and our praises to our Lord. Um, if you're online, you can do so by uh, putting in comments, uh, your prayer requests, um, but also here. Uh, we're going to do that together. Uh, I'm going to open up with prayer. And then I'm going to leave time for you to list your, or to say your prayers or your praises. And I'll try to sum it up and then say, in your mercy, and you're invited to respond, Lord, hear our prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you today, challenged to be a, your kingdom on earth. And Lord, uh, we pray for the Spirit's empowerment. We pray that... Um, we each will use our gifts for the good of your kingdom. Uh, Lord, we want to be a people who are salt and light in this world. So teach us how. Open up our eyes and our ears to how we can do so. And give us the courage to do so. Lord, um, I want to start with the praises part and thank you for the uh, recovery you've given uh, my father-in-law. Uh, thank you for the healing of the surgery and how that has helped so much. And we thank, for, thank you for the report that there is no cancer anywhere else. Lord, we thank you for that and uh, we bless you and we give you honor and praise for that. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, for Larry and Nancy, in your mercy. Lord, I pray for my friend Johanna, who is suffering from cardiac problems and joint disorder. We lift up to you, Johanna, in your mercy. Thank you. 
for the schools and teachers and uh, parents as they try to figure out uh, this next school year. In your mercy. For your protection from illness, in your mercy. Lord, we lift up all these things. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we leave this place, the choir will sing uh, once again, Go Now in Peace, um, through the video. And uh, just a reminder to go out and be the church.